I believe we're live. Sorry if there's any awkwardness at home while we all sit here just waiting to start, but I understand that we're actually good to go now. So thank you all for joining us. Um, my name's Robert. I'm a, an art historian and fashion historian, and I spent 10 years working at Hand and Lock. I was intimately involved in the brief and very kindly, they keep coming back and asking me to to, to work on the prize. And that's a delightful thing to be asked to do. This time I've been asked to host the webinar with our wonderful guests. And this, this webinar is specifically all about meeting the mentors and exploring artistry in embroidery. I'm going to introduce you all to our mentors today and they're gonna tell you a little bit about their practice. They're also gonna tell you a little bit about their inspirations and then I'm sure a lot of you are very keen to hear about how they're going to approach mentoring. Um, the mentoring process um, was established quite a few years ago, um, but some of these guys are still quite new to it. So it might be quite interesting to see how they're going to approach it and how they hope to help people who've entered this year's prize develop their submission ready for the finale. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the brief because um, uh, there's still a few months left before, well, no, there's till the 8th of July um, until you have to do your first submission. But from the 8th of July to the 9th of September, there's still an opportunity to work on your projects and develop them and change them. And, uh, and that's what the mentoring process is about. Taking your existing idea, which is surely brilliant, but making it a winner in the prize. So enough from me, I would like to introduce my guests. Today I have Chloe Amy Avery, hello there. Hey. Uh, Elizabeth Ashdown, who has assured us we can call her Libby, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and we have Danielle Cloth, who also goes by Fiance Knowles. Hello there. Hi. Um, I think I'd like to start with you, Chloe. Um, um, I, I was very impressed. You've got your BA and MA from London College of Fashion, which is just where I would love to have gone if I was a fashion designer <laughs> or a textile artist. Um, and your creations, I've, I've read that they're large scale. They are intricate works and they're hyper-realistic. That's all fine, but what fascinates me is the food, the nostalgia, the nature, and then the flame series, your observation of the flame series. Can you please tell us a little bit about your practice and your work? Yeah, okay. So. Hello everyone, nice to meet you. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to come on here and just chat to you firstly. I mean, what an exciting celebration of embroidery that you're a part of. So good job and I'm excited for what I'm gonna see uh, coming into the competition and seeing what you guys are gonna come up with. Um, I, yeah, I was trained in fashion, um, but uh, went down the route of embroidery after many years of like working out what, what I really wanted to do. Um, but my inspiration comes from uh, culture and people I just love and fascinated by um, just the people I live with um, just in the streets around me in London it's so diverse um, my initial food uh, inspiration came from living abroad and just feeling like a, a real longing for the sort of mass-produced basic stuff that I really miss from home and it just got me thinking about how we all have such a different story just life generally brings such different things into our path that we um makes us different from one another um but food is such a huge part of that whether you have a lot or whether you don't have a lot whether you have good memories with food or not it's food is like essential to everyone's own identity in that way so that was that was part of my huge inspiration then um but i'm just inspired by just people around me really uh, my light series was off the back of the um coming in, you know during the lockdowns and just a sense of like everyone's in quite a different place again you know whether you lost your job or you've actually appreciated the time to just uh, refuel there was, and and you might have lost people or your situation in life has changed so much so the, the light thing was a was um something that sort of connected people in an instant you know like the, the, a lit match or um light was just a sense of hope in the, in quite a dark time um so yeah that's where my inspiration just comes from people really um across the board and that my recent project on my floral as well is 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 off the back of the lockdown and um all that we've been through as a as a world 
um, mm -hmm. in that is a celebration of life. So again, it's ongoing, but I wanted to really, it, I'm always trying to draw on people's emotions. So yeah, that's where I come but from. <laughs> I'd say my, I had an emotional response to the flames straight away. And, and if uh, anyone at home doesn't already follow Chloe, Chloe on, um, on Instagram, you definitely should. The, the flame series, I think it's that wonderful light and darkness and you immediately resonate with it because mm. you know it, it it's it's spiritual as well as but they're also beautifully executed no, thank, thank you very much for that introduction chloe i'm gonna go to libby um libby okay now this is equally impressive in terms of institutions libby just casually did a weaving degree at central st martin's and then that wasn't enough so she decided to go and get an ma from the royal college of arts um, went back for more <laughs> yeah yeah and and such such unheard of institutes as well I, I, I <laughs> so i'm not doing a phd <laughs> that's it phd next <laughs> um i, I would have to say <laughs> we need to clarify straight away that amongst this group of textile artists we have two embroideries and one passementerie artist now my french is so so but uh, it is passementerie, is that right? Yes, well, passementerie, yeah, I, I can't really pronounce it the proper French way because anyone with a beautiful French accent, it just rolls off the tongue. But passementerie, that's fine. Passementerie. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about passementerie, your practice? And, and I would be interested to know as well where you see that maybe intersecting with embroidery, knowing that they are very different disciplines. Do you know, I was really reflecting on this um, when I was asked to, to kind of be a mentor because weaving is so different from embroidery in lots of ways, but actually there's real synergies between both disciplines. It's really interesting and there's, there's a real connection. You know, it's all about hand craft and hand making and the intricacy and beauty and actually making something. Mm -hmm. So in that way, there, there are, and you know, also from the time perspective, my work takes forever to make. Um, but basically what Passamontre is, is it's an endangered craft in the UK. It's a very old craft, basically as old as time. Um, and it's essentially the creation of ribbons, trimming, braids, tassels, fringes, it's all sorts of things, anything ornamental and decorative. So, you know, it's the, the trimmings you get on fancy curtains and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, they, they've even found little examples of fringes in the pyramids, Egyptian pyramids. So it's something that, that has this incredible heritage to it. Hardly anyone knows about it. Humans have a desperate desire to decorate. Just to trim. It is <laughs> it's all about trimming and accessorising and, you know, creating these amazing environments or trimming what you're wearing. There's it's some really interesting um, readings actually about the Victorians and their obsession with trimmings and how it was deemed symptomatic of the Victorian empire and how it was yeah. falling apart at the edges and, and the trimmings were a way of decorating and effectively concealing the hard edges of Victorian so society. Um, yeah. and, and I think we, we do, I mean, I know a lot of my encounters with those kind of decorations and trimmings are um, with the military, there's um, yeah, fantastic, absolutely. what looks like a decorative element of a, a, um, a pole axe yeah. um, carried by a ceremonial guard. And it's incredibly elaborate, um, but its purpose is to mitigate the splatter of blood during violence. Oh, really? And you think oh. this beautiful trimming is just purely decorative, but it serves a rather gory and grotesque yeah. function. Isn't that um, amazing? Do you, do, you, do you ever produce anything that's designed to mitigate the splatter of blood? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> All my work is about beauty. It's a, <laughs> no, it doesn't have a true purpose. But it's interesting because Henry VIII was absolutely obsessed with trimmings because they were used as a real symbol of power and wealth and status. And they've been used in that way right across the world for, for literally since the dawn of time. It's a way of signaling power. It, it is. And Henry VIII was even, you know, when he went to France to meet whoever it was, French king, in 15 something, it was something called the Field of Gold. And he took 14 tents, well, to call them tents doesn't really do them justice, 14 marquees, which were apparently just bedecked in the most incredible embroideries, passamontre, as a sign to terrify the French. Look how much power we've got. So it's, it's really got quite an incredible history. And like I said, there's only six of us in the UK um, still actually working with the craft. Yeah. 
So I, I guess you would hope that maybe if your embroidery mentee, your entrant, um, is open to it, they might, might um, become the seventh. They might incorporate. <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to reduce your commissions. And thank you very much, Libby. Oh, you're um, welcome. Thank you. Danielle's joining us all the way from Canada, which is very confusing because you're from South Africa. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, you studied at the wonderfully named Red and Yellow School in Cape Town. Please tell me it's actually Red and Yellow. Uh, it was painted red and yellow uh, for a while. And it's, I think the byline for the school, what used to be when I was there, uh, the School of Magic and Logic, which is kind of like a Hogwarts for Hogwarts. advertising. I don't know. It was quite cool, yeah. But it was very, um, um, very commercial. So it's an advertising school. Amazing. Um, most people might know you as Fiancé Knowles on Instagram, where you have an insane following. Um, I discovered your work years ago when I was putting together Hand and Locks magazine. Um, and I think we had to include you because, to me, your work was so exciting. It was so on the nose for contemporary culture at that time. And dabbling a little bit with, with fat fashion criticism, I would almost argue. Um, but can you tell yeah. me a little bit about your work and and some of the fantastic places that or some of the fantastic commissions you've had. Yeah, I mean, I've been very, very fortunate. I think I kind of was what I see it as doing the right thing at the right time with Instagram in like 2016. So I managed to, or 2015, 2016. So my work kind of, I, I do embroideries on um, alternative surfaces. So I work on uh, old tennis rackets and I do a lot of floral embroideries straight onto the racket. And those went viral. Um, you know, 2016 and I just kind of at the time I was a VJ and a waitress and a designer and a photographer like anything to just get by and uh, like really hustling and within three months I was a full-time embroiderer which has been like the biggest gift of my life I just am so lucky to be able to do this um, but yeah it just kind of becomes this perpetuating cycle the more work you do the more or the more work you get the more work you do the better you get the more work you get so it was really cool um I've been able to work with brands like Adobe, Gucci, the United Nations. Um, I've been commissioned by David Letterman and Drew Barrymore. I've uh, worked for, I think I did a jacket for Northwest, <laughs> which is like um, Kanye's child, but I don't know if they ever put it on her. Um, and yeah, so some done some really, really cool commissioned work, worked for uh, Adidas, Nike, Vans, oh, just a bunch of stuff. Yeah, it's been really amazing. Well, I had a list of everyone you worked with, and um, I don't need to read them out now. You've mentioned everyone. <laughs> I, I did. I, what I loved particularly, though, was that dichotomy between Drew Barrymore and Kanye West. But you've explained that now. But your portraits of people, you, um, the, I think there's, uh, if I'm not wrong, okay, let me think here. Who did Basquiat? Was that you, Danielle, or was that you, Chloe? No, Danielle. Maybe both of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Basquiat and that portrait of Definitely. Basquiat, uh, the colours in it are absolutely beautiful. And part of this year's brief is about approaching colours in a unique way. But mm. I definitely want to talk to you about your approach to colours. Um, uh, I, I've got a specific question for each of you. And my question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about Travels Through the Paint Box by Victoria Finlay, which I know is a very influential yeah. book? Yeah, well, I, I've got a I, I I'm a firm believer that everybody has an innate color language I mean if you open up your your cupboard you'll see what your color language is when you grab um when you're at a shop and you see something that's patterned like you're naturally drawn to your innate language and you know that's awesome and I think what it is is about tapping into that language and then being able to apply and utilize it in your work um but I've always my innate color language has always been like raving it's just like I've had like neon colored walls my whole so I think I've just you know people are like oh you're really bold with your colors I'm like am I so it's just what I'm naturally drawn to um it's and like I think one's beautifully lit in a nightclub <laughs> everything's <laughs> these purples and these blues but they, <laughs> the, I think it's the, the dialogue between the tones in the face that you have so right because it could look garish it could look crazy but you obviously have a real strong instinct for color did that come from travels with my paint box no no I think that's just been innate throughout my life but then only later as I got like a little bit older and I started realizing and I just you know you just work and you naturally create the work that you do and it progresses and your style develops and your voice develops and I think 
my voice developed and and then you you don't really initially know until people start going like oh your style looks like this or your color work is so that's kind of where I started realizing like oh I do have a natural like love for color I just thought you know you you have something that's in your just feels normal so you don't really question it until people like point it out and then I started kind of getting more interested in the history of color the history of embroidery so um stumbled upon colors which was probably one of the best books I've ever had the fortune of stumbling upon Victoria Finlay is an incredible writer so it's all about the history of color but it's also about like the science of it and it's how where it is in history today she's actually just come out with a book called fabric it's like this thick and it is incredible I hope you're getting a commission <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just um I'm just a bit of a creep and I like it's I message you on Instagram every now and then as well. <laughs> well, I've just picked out the brief here for this year and um a lot of it is talking about colours and reconsidering how colour exists in nature and explore how artists have interpreted and altered the way we see the natural world so I would urge anyone that's listening now that really wants to play with colour to consider picking up this book and just in case anyone missed it it's Travels Through the Paint Box by Victoria Finley. I promise I've not got shares in the company this is just because it sounds like a really awesome book for this brief. Um, I'm going to return to you Chloe actually because I think that I think that embroidery there's a lot of community in embroidery and I can't help but feel that there was a big element of community in your project um, a while ago, which was Stitch an Influential Woman Every Day for a Month. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Because it sounds amazing. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm from a family, of uh, seven of us, seven kids, and I have six brothers. So uh, to, to draw attention to women is always a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, I, I just, at the time, I wanted to push myself a bit and I was in a bit of a, sort of a low flat place and I was like right come on these all these women out here that are just really inspiring let me let me get them stitched um and set myself a challenge of um yeah just 30 days of stitching these wonderful women just a bit of um self in, in self-indulgence really I guess and just like inspired by these women and give me a chance to read up on some people and just be um just yeah indulged in in the great women out there and uh, from the yeah. point of view of the process, did you yeah. find your, um, you were changing? The, surely the pressure of having to do a, an embroidery in a day, that kind of shorthand embroidery style, you must have developed new skills over those 30 days. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm a mum of three, so pressure and time is always like, I've got to get this down quick if I want to get an idea, otherwise it won't happen. So again, for me, finding like shortcuts and trying to, I, I'm a really incredibly messy painter um, and I love to do things really quickly. So embroidery is quite a, a contrast to that. So I was trying to like play around with how do I, how do I get my message across with, with thread in the same way I like to use paint. So it's quite free and actually it's quite an exciting experience just like in the few lines that I'm putting down to represent these women in, in the best way I could. Um, so what it did definitely push me. I'm always like, oh, what, what should be my next quick project, you know? But um, you want to do it yeah, again? Quite, yeah, definitely. But you know, you have to. How did right um, how did people respond online to these? It's, this must have been something quite exciting to just even participate in as a as a follower on Instagram. Yeah, definitely. I had quite a few commissions. I do. I actually didn't put this on purpose, but I have my uh, Amelia Earhart. Uh, t-shirt on today um like it's just, I wear it all the time but um yeah quite a few commissions of like people wanting people that they just wanted to have on t-shirt um and people just loved it I think just the just the celebration of really great women was was received so well um I was quite surprised actually how well it was I, I, I don't know I think as a as a woman trying to uh, pave a way yourself in a in an area that you're like is there really work out there for an embroidery artist in this season but um and then you know putting these women in front of people who have done great things is just it was well celebrated it was a good it was a good thing to do um, yeah thank you Libby I like to imagine right now you are 
in a lab laboratory and that there's people mixing potions and chemists and all sorts of stuff. Are you in the experimental weave lab? And if yes. you're not, can you tell us what on earth I am. It sounds fantastic? Well, I am. So I'm in the building. It's actually, it's just behind me in these double doors. I'm kind of perched in the kitchen. Basically, so the experimental weave lab is the city of London's first contemporary weaving season. So I um, co-run it with a really fantastic weaver called Philippa Brock. Um, and I mean, we've been, we've been working on this for ages, but it officially launched in April. So we're here April to September, right in the heart of the city. Uh, so Fenchurch Street Station is literally just over the road. So we're surrounded by all these skyscrapers. We've got the Gherkin just behind us. It's all high finance and you know, whatnot. And then we've got this gaggle of weavers. Um, so we're, basically how it works is we're running it as a series of artist residencies. So over the whole program, we've got nine different weavers coming in. Um, and the idea is to support them to make experimental work for a month at a time. But everybody receives wow. a stipend. So everybody's paid to be here. And that was really important for us. Um, so at the moment, we're just about to swap over. So we've got two weavers leaving and we've got someone else joining us uh, in July. But it's been so fantastic. Um, and we've built a real community of weavers. And what's really great as well is that most of us, you know, prior to being here, because I'm here for six months, there's three of us here for six months doing a residency as well as running it. Um, and most of us worked on our own before. So, you know, it's kind of long hours on the loom, very similar to embroidery. You're just sitting there working on your own for hours and hours a day. And now all of a sudden we're all in this room together and there's so many interesting conversations and synergies between people. Well. And it's, it's just been absolutely fantastic. It's I been think really so often brilliant. textile artists, embroiderers, weavers, they kind of work in, in solitary to an yeah. extent. And, and that, much of that is the necessity of concentrating on your own. But I think yeah. you know, things like your lab and things like the prize are a really nice opportunity to for, for these poor people to crawl out of the shadows and <laughs> come into the light blinking and meet other people. I'm sure yeah. that's unfair. I'm sure no one's like... <laughs> Crawling out from a rock going, okay. <laughs> but that's why the mental programme is so good because I feel like you really need that as a creative person because most of us do work on our own and it's really, really hard. Well, You've been on your own for eight hours a day. You've got no one to talk to, no sounding board. No, and that's it. You mentioned it there, sounding board. I think we do need the outside voice sometimes. And even if the outside voice is reassuring us and saying, this is really good, or being honest with us when it isn't and saying this could be better, you know, we do actually need that person. And it helps when that person knows what they're talking about and has experience and looks like you guys. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious because I think it, it goes to show the variety of people in this space to always ask about what you did before and Danielle I, I know you you said before the the call that you you hustled I would like you to expand upon that before the world of embroidery how did you get by wow <laughs> um well I was I studied advertising and art direction but I had kind of found sewing before I I wanted to be a fashion designer but I dropped out but I had a little bit of like I knew how to use a machine, like very basically. So I would, I mean, when I finished my studies, I would make plush toys for friends. I was waitressing. I was a hostess. I would VJ. So VJ is a visual jockey. So, you know, when you go to an event and there's a screen that like changes to the music, there's a person at the back with a little APC controller. That I might like add, me. I read just this week that that NFT digital artist Beeple, the one that sold a piece yeah, of $69 million at Christie's last mm -hmm. year, before he, he was could a, sell his works, he was a VJ. He, he made he his was a VJ. those graphics. Yeah, yeah. So most, I mean, actually, it's so funny that, that, that you mentioned you're the only other person I think that's ever said it because all, most VJs would use Beeple work. So... If you went to any party pretty much between or any events, it's even in, I see the clips in movies and stuff from like 20, well, yeah, 2020 to like 2016, you would have seen Beeple's work without actually knowing it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if anyone knows Beeple or maybe you don't know Beeple, um, Beeple is a digital artist who's 
sold an NFT, an actual digital artwork of his 1,000 days work, which Chloe is a little bit like what you did, except I think he, no, it was, okay. was it, I think it was, it was a 5,000 days work. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it was like 5,000. Yeah, you stopped at 30 days. He did it for 5,000 yeah. days. <laughs> <laughs> well, I th what I thought was interesting about that is suddenly he's this famous digital artist, but he'd been grafting away doing whatever he could behind the scenes beforehand. It doesn't, yeah. what do, what's that old expression um, um, about things happening overnight all of a sudden after 10 years graft, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so how so, does that I mean, inform he... what you're doing now? How does that inform your practice today? Well, one of the things I'd also kind of picked up and, and was doing semi-professionally and then I decided to turn it back into a hobby and, and find other ways to, to make income um, was photography. And I think photography, design, it all kind of builds your visual language, um, your skills. I think photography gave me a good understanding of lighting. I use I, as much as possible. Obviously, I can't with pop culture, with my pop culture work, but I like using my own references, taking portraits really like sculpting light and, and and then I've got Photoshop experience and graphic design experience so then that comes with like build, like again building the visual language how, learning how to tell a narrative or pass on a message through your work so everything like ugh, I mean I'm a, such a firm believer that absolutely everything you do matters everything you do informs the next thing working as a waitress has given me so much experience with dealing with people so you know so that's even coming into commissions how to how to like you know just every single thing it connects. rounds you off it gives you all of the it, universal skills you need exactly and I think a lot of people feel like if you do one thing that's mathematic and one thing that's creative and they sit separately and then they never connect but actually everything you do builds on top of each other you know and you really are just like a combination of all your experiences, life experiences, work experiences, creative endeavors. Chloe, Libby, what did you guys do before? Chloe, I've, I've got this <laughs> image. I have this image of you. Um, I don't know, you kind of look a bit outdoorsy. I can half imagine you taking people up Ben Nevis. <laughs> that sounds brilliant. <laughs> I'm so, sometimes when you're, you're sitting on your own, you know, uh, at an embroidery and you're like, oh, just to be outside doing something really physical is quite nice. Uh, no, um, I studied studied fashion to MA level, um, but by then I think I was quite institutionalised and was done with fashion. Um, but again, like Daniela's reference, like all that you have learned on your journey um, sort of builds up to this point, you know, like I'm still learning all the time and there's still so many inputs into your life that you're like, oh, okay, that. I've learned that from there, from there, and you draw on all your experiences where, you know, even from raising kids to, I don't know, whatever it is, like there's so many things. To time draw on management. To, exactly. Yeah. My time management is quite spot <laughs> on these days. So yeah, um, I studied fashion and then I was uh, self-employed. I had my child quite, my oldest quite soon after I finished uni, maybe like two years. So um, uh, he's now like over 13. So I've worked self-employed all the way through having kids, making that. They've been my priority, really. So I haven't wanted to, like, distract from them being, you know, young. I want to be available at this point. So I've never really gone full out uh, into embroidery and, like, thrown myself into it. I've always done it sort of part-time in the evenings. So I'm always very tired. <laughs> Are you telling me you weren't the outdoorsy kayaking, <laughs> take people on tours up their Nevis at all? <laughs> No. I got that so wrong. <laughs> no, I'm a London girl. I like <laughs> I occasionally for a week in the summer like to get my my shoes muddy, but other than that, I'm just staying put. <laughs> it, yeah. it goes to show. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Libby, I, I'm fascinated to know what skills you brought from other areas. I'm gonna just throw one quick thing in before you answer that. Some mm -hmm. of the most interesting embroiderers I have met have said that they used to work as a buyer, they used to work as an accountant. And, and I just find this idea that people um, find or discover textile arts after another earlier career, absolutely fascinating. And I think it adds so much to the whole community. But Libby, tell us, what did you do before? Well, mine, I guess, is fairly conventional. I mean, when I, so when I graduated from my BA, I had two years between there and then going off to do my masters. So my final kind of collection for my BA was all passe montre. 
So I kind of graduated. I hadn't got a clue what I was going to do with any of this. But there was um, a competition at the time called Text Print that doesn't exist anymore. So I did that. And as part of that, you get to go to Paris and your, all your works exhibited at Premier Vision and, you know, whatever. So I made lots of sales from that and built up connections. And then I basically, for the next two years, worked as a, a freelance textile designer. But it was very commercial. So it was a little bit of passe tray, but it mainly wasn't. It was a lot of interior design fabrics. So it was all selling samples. Um, and then I got really fed up doing that for loads of different reasons I knew that my work had so much more potential than I was actually able to kind of exploit so I went back to do my master's and that's where everything just flipped everything just changed um, in all aspects of my life actually it was brilliant but that's where I was able to kind of concentrate on passamontre and actually what do I do with this so I stopped pretty much all of my commercial kind of work and transitioned everything over to more of a textile art practice. Um, and I also started teaching. So, and, I, and I've taught for years and years and it was never sort of my intention. It was kind of offered to me. And then I realized how much I love it. And I, I've taught ever since. Um, so I'm kind of in my studios three, three days a week, three to four, and then teaching the rest of the time. I think teaching though is one of those things a lot of embroiderers teach um, but I also find just generally with teachers I think you're in that environment all the time engaged with people talking to people it must it creates I think a two-way inspiration yeah, all of your students inspire yeah. you as you should be inspiring them yeah. well I think actually I earn an awful lot more from my students than they probably do for me <laughs> and it, it's really interesting one of Libby's students <laughs> remember she said that <laughs> But I think it's really interesting because you're teaching basically the same techniques. I mean, I teach passamontre, but I also teach general weaving. And um, so it's, it's the same things over and over again. Yeah, everyone interprets it in radically different ways. And quite often it's things that you've, you've not considered, whether it's colour or it's material or whatever it is. So from that point of view, you know, I'm always learning new stuff. It's weird. Well, I think... Um... I think we've got a really good understanding of our three guests now. If anyone at home wishes to submit any questions and, and build upon what we've already been talking about, you are welcome to submit questions through Zoom and we'll try and answer them at the end. But I think now I'd like to go on and talk a little bit about the 2022 brief. Um, those of you at home watching this, I hope you've had the opportunity to read the brief and study it. If you haven't, it is on the Hand and Lock website. And I'm not going to read the whole brief out, but I'm going to try and summarise it for you. <clears throat> the entrants this year have been asked to complete a brief titled, to submit work based on a brief titled The New Nature, Embellished Design in Harmony with the Natural World. So that's fairly nebulous. It sounds like you could go all over the place, but we go into a bit more detail and ask people to reconsider how colour exists in nature and explore how artists have interpreted and altered the way we see the natural world. Apply your own cultural lens, allowing colour to lead your design story. So my question to the mentors is, in a brief about nature, how should our entrants be thinking about colours? It seems far too easy to just go with green and <laughs> floral colours. Can, can they go crazy with colours? I'll start with you, Danielle, please. Yeah, I, I was just like thinking about that brief and, you know, the, it says they reconsider how colour. So you can look and you can really dissect that and decide where you're going to place your attention. Is it about colour in nature? Is it about reconsidering color does that mean that you're changing it up and you're trying to think about it in a different way like we exactly that we see everything as green but perhaps are we thinking about it through somebody who is colorblind who has a completely different experience of of natural colors so i i think i think when it comes to something like this again it's always, there's always like a, a natural voice where somebody has their own style and they have their own ideas and that's where their unique kind of position is going to come from and finding that and then and building around that so I think I would be I would be apprehensive to say how how one should go about it and just kind of say go about it and then build and and play and just really flesh out as many ideas as as you can and and then pull from there 
and just but yeah. look at every word break it down so that you can like expand yourself outside of just green <laughs> that's a good point actually with the brief it is good to try and um, go through it with a highlighter pick out the words that are relevant to you and your practice but you know also try mm. and intuit what you think the judges might be interested in and, and the things that I would say are important in this brief are colour but also biomimicry um, a very unfamiliar term to me until this particular brief and I'm sure a lot of people don't know what biomimicry <clears throat> is um, I'm not Wikipedia, I'm not going to explain, but I'll give you an overview. Biomimicry is essentially thinking about when you create something, thinking about how nature might approach creating that thing. So whereas we humans want waterproof, we use plastics. Nature can't manufacture plastics, but it can manufacture feathers in which the water just rolls straight off. So there's a, a natural solution in nature that gives animals a waterproof um, covering, let's say. So biomimicry is, is essentially being inspired by nature to solve solutions. But the, another thing about bio nature, uh, biomimicry is, um, is recycling. The, nothing is wasted in nature. Everything finds its way back into the system and reconstitutes as something else. So we humans in our design practices should be more, um, more interested in whether our garments that we're creating are biodegradable or if they're made out of something that's already recycled in the first place. I'm going to um, turn this into a question eventually, so I'm not on my soapbox forever. Libby, from what you know of biomimicry and what you've read of the brief, do you think, have you got any specific ideas on maybe how you would approach it if you were an entrant? Oh, that is a really good open-ended question. Um, <laughs> That's wow. a okay. question. Well, I think there's I think the beauty of this brief that is that it contains so much that you can draw from and it's so open-ended. And I actually went through not with a highlighter but with a pen and, and kind of underlined those keywords. I mean obviously colour is of paramount importance. And, you know, as Danielle was, was kind of saying, there's every single color possible in nature. Nature's not just green. That's the really amazing thing about it. Whether you're really interested in kind of muted soft colors or you're really going for the really bold brights or whatever it is. But I think from my kind of very limited reading of biomimicry, it's really all about um, valuing nature from what you can learn from it rather than actually extracting and using natural materials and you know, harvesting in that way. So I think you could pretty much, you know, utilize this brief however you wanted to, which is the beauty of it. I mean, there's so much that you could do with it, whether you're interested in sustainability or complete reuse of materials or actually you want to look about, you know, how plants exist or, or live or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I'm not sure how I would actually approach the, <laughs> how I would approach me, but I'd probably find it really difficult just to pinpoint, you know, further, um, further down. I think that's what's it the might, yeah. hmm. it might be, it might be worth looking at the principles of nature. Um, so kind of setting, looking, uh, doing the research, because I mean, if the, like, like Libby says, if it's about learning from nature, so going in and looking at the principles of how nature, not, you know, how, how nature will tackle certain things, how, with like like um like how my cilia works just to make sure that every how it communicates and how it connects um and just looking at essentially at principles of nature and then applying that to the work so almost like using that as a as a, a value you know like mm -hmm. what is the ethical value of nature if nature was a person how what would they believe in and then using those beliefs to then um mold your work no, absolutely. I think taking a philo philosophical approach to philosophical. Good. Um, I mean, one thing that keeps occurring to me as well is there is crossover between biomimicry and colour because nature uses colour for specific purposes. Um, obviously, all those beautiful coloured flowers that Chloe is embroidering at the moment um, in nature, they are designed to catch the eye um, of the insects, of the bees, etc. Um, and it just happens to be a lovely byproduct that we also enjoy the way they look. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, um, I think a lot of people at home and a lot of people who are new to embroidery might not have technical precision or technical excellence. And I think that's something that comes with training. It comes a lot with maybe working in the industry and working for someone else who's got a very precise vision. So you have to align your style with theirs, but obviously, 
If you're an artist, you might maybe have a more artistic expression. So I think this is a question for you maybe, Chloe. How do you think our entrance should balance precision quality stitches with artistic expression that's supposed to feel alive and explosive and, and mm. creative? Yeah, good one. I think I, I think my top my tip would be, you know, once you've done your research, what 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 excites you? What excites you about the brief? What you, it excites you about what you've discovered as you've read stuff and looked into it? And then um, experiment, I think, is really key. So if if you're trying something and it's and it's a bit more contrived and you're actually not really enjoying it then maybe it's not the thing move on you know like I think with my with my style how I've sort of I'm really not uh, very precise in and I'm technically I wouldn't say I was very good at embroidery at all but I've developed that over time um my style and I think it's just through experiment what works for you it's like a handwriting right so as you as you work and you work out okay, I really love this way of working, then carry that on, take it further, experiment within that, uh, that style that you're, you're working with. Until you find something you love and you can't put down, I'd say. And then, um, you, you, you know, you'll touch on something on the brief that just really excites you and that will inspire you to take it in a direction that you'll want to carry on and, and you'll love what you're doing. I think that's really important as you work on this brief that, um, and I'm excited to see, you know, who whoever I get to to mentor I, I mean I love training people and seeing how their creative process comes out so um it's part of giving you give your give yourself freedom don't look at other people's work and think I want to be it needs to be like this because that's successful you've got to work out what your own style is in that yeah. even if it is you know not technical don't don't worry don't fret about it I guess yeah. to anyone who's watching this who maybe is working in a very precise embroidery industry you know measured stitches this is your opportunity to let loose this is your opportunity to go um I'm doing this for me I'm creating something that I want to be really expressive so um let loose uh, Chloe you mentioned there about the pairing of the entrance with the mentors and just so everyone knows that the um the first round of images need to be submitted on the 8th of July. The finalists will be selected by the judging panel on the 29th of July. And then between the 29th of July and the 9th of September, that's when you'll be paired with your mentors and you'll have the opportunity to work with them. So um, if you're hoping you get Chloe, you know, fingers crossed because Chloe might be the perfect person for you, or maybe it's gonna be Danielle or maybe Libby. Um, I wanted to ask this to all of you. So, you know, just chip in if you think this is a question you think you can answer. Briefs, hand and lock, write a brief and try and get the ball rolling um, uh, from a creative standpoint with our entrance. But how do you guys respond to a brief? Is it a positive or a negative thing? Uh, I have, oh God, go for it. Oh, sorry, sorry, Chloe. <laughs> go for it, go for it. Go on, your response is a bit positive. <laughs> Libby was first on the buzzer there. <laughs> No, I was going to say, I absolutely love a brief. I mean, I come from a design background, so I'm really well versed in working with a brief. But if I'm doing self-initiated work, like I'm doing for my residency at the moment, I have a brief. I've written something to work. You write yourself your own brief. Oh, but yeah, my own brief. I do it all the time, as well as responding to clients' briefs, because I find that you need something to tie your work down to, or you need that starting point. And if you don't have it, there's too much selection, there's too much choice. You don't have a, a focus. So I, I think they're fantastic. And, you know, if, it, if it's a good brief, like Hand and Lock one, it's something really open-ended. So it's not prescriptive. It's just guiding you and saying, look, you know, hey, look at this. You can basically do what you want with it. Mm. What about a client's brief? Who's got, has anyone, if, does anyone receive client's briefs and and have to think oh <laughs> no or yes briefs can be really challenging I'm a dyslexic so when I get a page of writing in front of me I'm always horrified and trying to work my way through it is quite a bit of a nightmare but I think the key thing is to pull out like Libby said you're like just pull out the bits that are standing out for you try and try and um rephrase it in a way that you can work out um uh the brief is there to help you so I think it's really important 
at the same time as maybe if you're like myself uh, and find it a challenge. Um, but a, a brief for, set from a client is is really helpful because it immediately gives that communication where you're on the same page. So it is a brilliant starting point. So yeah, it, it's yeah. important to, to don't, use, don't it. Be use it. Don't by a brief. No. <laughs> the other thing, I've, oh, sorry. Go on, Danielle. No, no, no. No, I was saying... Um, I find corporate briefs are very different to brief, uh, a prize brief. You know, a corporate brief is kind of like there's usually an outcome um, at the end of it, and it's usually to sell something. So it's it's a lot more rigid. Where I think something like like a prize, um, some or competition brief, where it's open, it's actually really about you. You know, you finding a space to create work within this like framework, and then the the brief is just boundaries. So you just just can't you know you just knock on to a few things but I think that it's amazing I prefer working with a brief because just like Libby says you can't have infinite opportunity options mm -hmm. you know because there are too many options you kind of sit there and you're like I like going okay you've got five colors it's this big go you know I, so I think it's a, great as a writer I'm I'm in hand and lock know full well if they um commission me to write something I'm like give me a brief give me a word count Who's yeah. the audience? I like, I want some parameters and then I can get creative. Yeah. And if someone doesn't give me a brief, I sit there staring at a blank screen for ages. Don't, I don't even know where to start. So if nothing else, it's something that should hopefully, you know, light the match under your creative process. And um, staying with you, Danielle, I did want to, now the Hand and Lock Prize exhibition last year was so diverse. Um, entrants can create apparel. They can create accessories, art objects, canvas art. Basically, if it's if it's got embroidery, if it's decorated, if it's good, it ends up there. In your experience, what are the biggest challenges of embroidering on non-conventional surfaces, like tennis rackets? Like tennis rackets. I entered actually into the Hand and Lock Prize. I'm not sure if it was 2020 or 2021, and I worked on salvage fishing nets, um, which was tough. It's uh, well, I think, I think again, kind of connecting it to the brief is that I think that creativity is actually just a form of problem solving. You know, you have an idea and then you find, I, I at least personally find that's my most exciting, that's when I get like all like fired up. It's like, how am I going to do this? Oh, I'm going to go to a hardware store and, you know, and like figuring out solutions. And I think that that's, um, I think that's why I love working on alternative surfaces. So as tough as it is, once you figured it out and you found a solution around it, it's ama it, it's really rewarding. So the challenge, you know, the challenge, I think the reward and the challenge kind of work itself out, balance itself out. My fear for the Hand and Lock Prize has always been that someone will embroider um, a forklift truck. <laughs> put your holes in the entire thing drill holes everywhere and then embroider the whole thing and, and but have you seen that well no i've seen have carbonates you, no, have, you, yeah, have you seen carbonates and uh, yeah. oil tankers I, but I they're getting bigger I, and I bigger it, this is like expressionism. <laughs> yeah. this is like um expressionism in america in the 1950s it's like if the canvas hat wasn't rolled out on the floor in a barn it wasn't considered art and if the <laughs> gallery didn't have to knock it down knock down a wall to bring it in it wasn't happening <laughs> So I wonder if we might go through the same process. This is not encouraging any of you entry. I hope so. Big. Hand and lock, <laughs> don't, I don't think Hand and Lock wants to be knocking down walls at the venue of the next exhibition. Do it, go ahead. Um, okay, I've actually scattered my questions all over the place. I'm sure I've got one more. Well, actually, it might be a good opportunity to talk about um, yourselves being on the receiving end of mentorship. Um, we created the mentor program in the first place to try and give people who were entering the industry perhaps an opportunity to connect with someone who was already in the industry and if nothing else inspire confidence grant connections and obviously you know develop new more practical skills because a lot of people might have come from education where things are done a certain way but everyone knows when you're actually out there in the real world things are done a different way um, can any of you speak to your experiences with people who've maybe opened doors for you or, or helped you? Silence. No one's ever been helped. <laughs> no, I have. All yourself. I've, I've had a couple of really fantastic mentors, but there's one lady in particular that really stands out. Um, she was actually my university tutor, um, but she was really the first person, sort of educationally speaking, that really believed in me. And she could really, 
she could really see and understand my potential. And that's something that hadn't happened to me, you know, it, it, through school or whatever, um, particularly going to school, it was very academic. So she actually, she, she was incredible, but it wasn't a formal sort of mentoring type of thing. Uh, and since I've left college, we've built up a really good friendship. <coughs> but she was really instrumental in sort of allowing me to grow the confidence within myself, mm -hmm. within my work. And actually she really enabled me to understand that I was capable of doing it and capable of taking a different path. And actually, and I had that within me to be able to do that and make it successful. So even though it might have not been, you know, strictly a formal sort of thing, she, she's been absolutely incredible. I think- I had a similar from, thing, sorry. Go, I was going to say, I think away no, no, from no. textile art mentors, you can just be mentored in life as well. People can yeah. just give you the boost of confidence. But sorry, Daniel, what were you going to say? No, no, I just had a similar thing where I was, I was also at school and I, I just didn't, um, I did fine academically, but I just wasn't really built for the conventional school system. And I was told by a teacher to leave. She was like, if you can get out of here. And I did, and I did an alternative matric and it changed my life. And I bumped into her at a post office the other day. And I was like, Miss Lean, I don't know if you remember me about 12 years ago and blah, blah. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes you just need somebody to say like, it's okay that you don't necessarily fit into this picture. Like there is a place for you go <laughs> oh I could have done with hearing that many a times in my life um I think I think I mean, as well just having other creatives even if they're not in your field um other creatives around you that are maybe a little bit further on down the line I, I I've got a very special friend who is um in a different line of work but um incredible artist and um just meeting with her and just being encouraged to encourage each other in in how you you know you're doing your own creativity but um just have good people around you to encourage you. <laughs> and hopefully you guys can be exactly that for our entrance, um, offering advice, offering guidance. In Danielle's case, telling them to get out while they still can, if necessary. <laughs> um, we've had some questions come through from the chat. I apologize to the people watching if I don't have names here, but um, I'll read this one out in full actually. So question from an attendee. So nice to get to know you all. My question is, how set does our idea concept design need to be by the 8th of July? I've loved the brief and got so involved in my ideas that I feel I need more time to go deep. Can the work evolve from the original idea between July and September? I'd love to meet a mentor as a sounding board at this stage. Well, I'll start this one off. And that's the whole purpose of the mentorship. So if your idea at the first submission stage catch inspires, the judge, judges and they want to know more then that's done its job but from that point the idea can be completely revised and I think I'll, I'll turn this over to the judges if you are presented with a piece of work and in all honesty you think this is brilliant but it could be better are you prepared to say are you prepared to speak up and say come on let's do this yes <laughs> yes, yes that's, that's the answer I think it, you want to think about it almost a little bit but like X Factor back in the day, you know, these guys are the mentors. They're going to take someone with raw talent, a great singer, and turn them into a pop star. But, you know, textile art instead. <laughs> how actually on that point, though, um, how does everyone feel about meeting up uh, in person? And do you think that's a necessity or do you think you can get away with doing things virtually like this? I think it depends. I think being online is absolutely fantastic we've all just had to get used to it haven't we and do it but i think you really miss out on a sense of sort of deep connection and community um and nothing really beats being in the room with another creative person and i guess with being textiles you want to touch it you want yeah. to turn it over and flip the back but yeah. needs must i mean not all of us can be where our entrants are i presume danielle you're going to be in south africa yeah, yeah, I'm leaving. I'm going to be leaving home in a, in a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be in South Africa. But um, then, I mean, I'm happy to host if anybody wants to make the prize. <laughs> I think, well, if you're from South Africa and you've entered the prize this year, make sure your first submission is kick-ass so you can meet Danielle because she's happy to host. <laughs> I'm just going to jump down to the next question. Is there a strict definition that you think embroidery is or can it be anything? This is from Emily Monk. 
embroidery is a very, very diverse term. And I know um, with obviously Passamentary being included this year and Sophie, the prize organiser herself, being uh, her entrant when she won years and years ago, wasn't strictly speaking embroidery, you might argue. I think there is quite a broad definition. Um, embellishment, decoration. How do you guys feel about where do you draw the line and say that's not embroidery anymore? Oh. I think that's a really good question. It's yeah. a hard one. <laughs> Particularly asking someone that's not an embroiderer. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, think... That that's... Sorry, Chloe, I was just going to say, I think that could be yeah. part of the brief, though, couldn't it? Really challenging and questioning what is embroidery. And what do we actually do with it? So, Emily, you're, we're not going to answer your question. We're going to let you answer <laughs> your own question with your own entrance. Challenge us. Um, I've got one last question here. Oh, Chloe, I feel like this one's for you. Uh -huh. What time management skills can you share when working on larger projects? Uh, when working on larger projects or to set deadlines, I often find that stress of working to deadlines impacts my creative expression, even when I'm originally excited by what I'm working on. Do you have any advice for dealing with creative, uh, creating within a deadline? Oh gosh, that is really challenging. Um, I, think, I think you just gotta look really realistically at your time you have and sort of almost write it down and be be really honest with yourself but how long you think things are taking and um, and set yourself set yourself realistic realistic goals really I mean I if you need to stay up late and it's taking forever then you have to do it you know it's a if you if you want to achieve something don't cut corners but mm -hmm. um but yeah work faster, work <laughs> faster. Work I, faster. I, I the only thing I would add to that is I think if you've got 10 hours to do something but you ground to a complete halt get up walk away refresh your head because if you sit there for 10 hours doing nothing that's 10 hours wasted but if you go out for one hour and recharge your batteries then the remaining nine hours can be, you know, yeah. spent well. But Danielle, how do you approach time management? Because I think your, your, I mean, all of your works look very labour and time intensive, but you very. have deadlines as well. Yeah, I, did, I just finished um, a portrait about this big for an album cover in nine days, eight <sighs> days, which was mad. But um, I, I recommend having a setup, like keeping your stuff out, doing a couple stitches in the morning. Like if you wake up and you've got a deadline, you can, like you get up, do something. I mean, obviously this depends on your lifestyle and what you're able to do. But I think sometimes you just, it's the starting that can be really hard. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to do, oh, and I'll, I'll do all these things. And then it's getting going. Um, sometimes you just need to start and then that momentum will kind of just carry you through. I heard that you're very messy. But you you say that you're, you're making a mess is part of your creative process. So I I'd like yeah. to expand upon that last question and just say, should people have everything lined up and ordered and try and be, or should they just let loose? I think it's, I think whatever makes you feel comfortable. I know some people can't be creative if there's mess around them. Some people have to have mess for them to be creative. So I think like, like carve out a space that's yours and then that space must just look however you need it to look. You know, there's, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about embroidery is that there's, this huge spectrum of ways you can work, whether it's like count work and it's everything is precise, or if you're doing felt like embroidery, felting, mixed media, like stuff like mine and Chloe's, where it's just layers and stitches where then you feel they need to be. Like there's a spectrum for your for your your archetype, you know, and your personality. So you find the thing that makes sense to you, and then you you just feed into that and you build into that. And if you can create a, uh, a space that nobody's allowed access to that looks the way you need it to look. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that builds into time management as well. Like mm. you need to shut out the unnecessary distractions. Uh, I, I've discovered with the iPhone, the focus mode and suddenly I can work. And then I'll turn focus mode off and I'll go, I've had 20 messages. That's fantastic. I'm so popular. But um, at least they didn't distract me in the moment. Um, I mean, that's literally 20 messages over a five day period. Um, I've got another question here from Laura Martyra. Um, OK, I think I can answer this one. She's saying I need a bit of text to explain my submission. Is it possible to add an extra page of text to the visual aspect of the submission? With the submission, you have three pictures of your work and three pictures of your supporting evidence. 
you should use those maybe graphically arranged and to try and tell your idea visually, but you also have the opportunity to tell your, um, to explain your idea in text. Um, if it requires more than that, then you might want to think about how you can condense it or simplify it because ultimately someone does have to read that and does want to look through that. And if they can't get your idea quickly, then they're going to move on to the next one. So I guess to Laura, I would say, find a way of making it very clear what your idea is and make it come across very quickly in those supporting images. Um, does it matter is if the work appears to be resolved? I think Vivian is asking here, um, if the work needs to be finished by stage one, by the, the first um, uh, submission deadline, no, but we need to be able to see your idea. And I think, I mean, my hope is that the judge, uh, that the, the mentors will have something that has room to grow and change. So if the item is fully resolved uh, down to every little seam, you as an entrant might be resistant to changes. Um, a few years ago, someone made this beautiful, they kilned their own little white beads, they did this amazing white top, and they happened to be partnered with a tailor. And the tailor looked at it and said, are you prepared to make changes? And she was like, mm, if I must. And they said, this should be tailored, this needs tailored trousers. So it became like a cool jumpsuit with an open back with this beading here. And I think it's being open to those changes. So to try and summarize, if your item is fully resolved, you can go ahead and submit it, but just bear in mind, be open to change. Um, I'm gonna throw this back to the mentors actually. How would you approach um, a piece where you think this is great, it's made, it's completed, but you want them to change it? Are you gonna, how, how are you not gonna ups upset your entrant? <laughs> Asking questions. In hopes questions. that it prompts a different way of thinking about something. So if you get Libby and she's asking a lot of questions, what she's really <laughs> trying to do <laughs> is get you to rethink your entire... No, not at all. But I think, you know, be open to change. What about you, Danielle, Chloe? How would you approach when you think it can just... If it needs a change? I think I would... Um, yeah, I, th I think realising that you you can see a potential for it to be better. I think I would just voice that, to be honest. I think I'd, I would just be like- No is around, do you? Very honest. <laughs> I think I would be like, look, I think if you did this, you could potentially increase the wow factor or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you'll get it blunt if you come with me, I think. <laughs> and you know, sometimes you've got to hear it that way. There's all kinds yeah. of feedback that you can get. And I understand, um, oh. I understand it is quite, sorry, I understand when you're putting a creative part in, into something, it's very personal and I, I do get mm. that. But at the same time as the other side of that, I, I know my husband is my biggest mentor and sort of critic, but it always pushes me and I'm like, oh, you know, half an hour later, I'm like, yeah, you so made that right call to like yeah. push me in that direction. So I you think it's beneficial. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Danielle? I think I'd probably do the, have you thought about line? <laughs> Oh, the little soft have voice. You, yeah, have, have you thought about trying? Um, no, I, I think just like Chloe and Libby, you know, just you ask questions. It's about, I mean, any kind of mentorship is about building confidence and um, maybe helping somebody refine specific aspects of their skills, but then in the same way, building confidence because they're building confidence, they build their voice. So I think, um, yeah, just kind of working on their strengths, figuring out what those strengths are, and then if there are ways that something can be improved, kind of saying, I think this can be improved. Well, thank you very much. I'm not going to read out any more questions. There's a couple that I've missed. So sorry to anyone that hasn't had their question read out. Um, uh, before I say goodbye and thank the mentors, there's just a few things I'd like to, one last thing you've got, you can answer very quickly and very shortly. How competitive are you feeling? Are you ready to kick each other's bums? <laughs> The three of us. Yeah, because you're going to be, you're going to be with each other in this. Wow, I didn't know that. 
Yeah, you yeah. want to take your I entrance did. to the final and you want to take your entrance to the top spot. Yeah. So, I did cross my mind yeah, and I feel not. slightly overwhelmed, to be honest. I'm like, oh, goodness, I've got to get this person through to a winning prize. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And um, bear in mind, though, when the final award is given out, you don't get to run up on the stage and push them out of the way. It's about the entrance, not about you. Um, uh, I'm going to finish just by um, running through some dates for people at home again. This is literally the last time I mentioned the dates, but I know it's important. The dates are all listed on the Hand and Lock website. But just so you know, for this first round where you're submitting images only, it's the 8th of July. Um, those people that enter their submissions on the 8th of July will find out around about the 29th of July. So the judges, and you should check out our judges online. We've got an amazing set of judges this year. The judges will make the decision and then we'll have our list of finalists. Um, between the 29th of July and the 9th of September is uh, when you work with your mentor to develop your ideas. And then finally, um, you'll submit your pieces between the 5th and 9th of September, the physical piece to the Hand and Lock Studio. And then at some point in November, there will be the awards. So that's everyone up to date with the dates. You can find all that information on the Hand and Lock website, and you need to make sure you follow everyone here on Instagram to be continuously inspired. And all that's left to do is say thank you to my guests. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Catch Danielle. Sorry? You've got a flight to catch. No, I've my bags are packed. I'm literally, I'm in. She's ready to go. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.